Okay, our second uh, student speaker for this session is uh, Jeff Lopez. Uh, Jeff is a fourth year PhD student in Jean and Bao's lab in the Department of Chemical Engineering. His research is focused on developing and studying novel polymers for lithium ion battery applications. And Jeff received his uh, Bachelor's of Science degree in Chemical Engineering from the University of Nebraska, where he worked with uh, Ravi Saraf on enzyme biosensors. And today, Jeff will be talking to us about uh, polymer binders for high-capacity lithium-ion batteries. Please join me in welcoming Jeff. Thank you. All right. Uh, well. First of all, thanks for being here, everybody. Really excited to share just a little bit of the work that I've been doing on trying to improve the capacity of, or the cycle life, excuse me, of high-capacity electrode materials for lithium-ion battery applications. And the reason we're working on um, battery applications, trying to improve these technologies, is that we see really uh, an area that we can impact in reducing CO2 emissions through greenhouse gas production here in the US. And most of that comes from either electricity generation or use in transport. And so what we can do is through either using these batteries to store energy from wind or solar, which are intermittent sources, so the sun only shines during the day and the wind only blows certain parts of the country and at certain times of the day, we can store that energy and then you can have the, uh, the constant power supply that you're used to with the current grid we have set up. Additionally, the other thing that we can do is we can use electric vehicles to replace our gasoline-powered vehicles. And what this allows us to do is reduce all of that CO2 production that comes from burning that gasoline. The problem is, though, um, and this is really the application that the batteries that I'm studying focuses on, is that these, these electric vehicles are quite expensive, and so they're pretty, um, they're not widely used yet. Uh, they're definitely out of my price range as a grad student. <laughs> And really, the, the huge cost of these comes from the, uh, you can see the battery. It costs more than about half the car, and that's actually the entire base plate of the Tesla Model S. It's about 8,000 lithium ion cells. And so there's two ways we can think about approaching this problem. One is we can improve the capacity, and then we can either decrease the number of cells and have the same range on our EVs with the lower cost, or we can keep the number of cells the same and then increase the range on our EVs, and that makes them more attractive to replace gasoline vehicles. So either of these things requires us to improve the battery technology that we have. So that's a question that people have been asking for a long time, and one of the answers is silicon. It has a theoretical capacity 10 times higher than that of graphite, which is a traditional electro electrode material used in commercial cells today. And it's also really cheap and quite abundant, and we have really a great infrastructure for producing silicon uh, for the semiconductor industry. The problem is, and the reason we're not using it today, is that it undergoes huge volume expansion when it charges with lithium. So you'll see, actually, it goes, um, there's a lithium phase, 4.4 lithium atoms for every one silicon atom, which is, uh, results in about 300% volume increase. And then when you delithiate, you go back through to amorphous silicon, and it shrinks. But silicon's not a balloon. It doesn't just blow up elastically. And so what instead happens is you have fracture and pulverization of your electrodes. And that leads to cracking. Uh, you'll either have pieces of your electrode mechanically delaminate, or you'll have new surface area that forms. And there's an electrolyte decomposition reaction that happens due to the really low potential of these silicon electrodes. And so both of these, those are the two problems that people are aiming to solve to make these uh, cells have more cycle life, which is what we want. One of the approaches, um, one of the most widely used ones, and really exciting one, is to do nanostructuring. If you structure the silicon below about 150 nanometers, that's really the critical dimension they found, uh, it stops breaking, and so it'll just expand and contract uh, anisotropically along different crystal planes, but it won't fail. And so there's been numerous ways, uh, two works here, the silicon nanowires and these core shell structures, or other GSEP work done here at Stanford and East Weiss Group. Um, but the problem with these nanostructured materials is that sometimes they're expensive and sometimes these processing techniques don't really amend themselves to scale up. And so we have a hard time imagining these uh, being realized on an industry scale. 
And so what I focus on, and I think the second approach that people are using, is to just play with the polymer binder. So an electrode is made up of really three components. It, one is the active material, silicon, which I'm talking about today. Two is some sort of conductive additive that makes, uh, facilitates electron transport through the material. And then third is this polymer binder, even in uh, traditional electrodes, commercial electrodes today, there's some sort of polymer binder. And so you can play with this. Uh, they're usually quite cheap, and they're easy to switch in and out of the materials, and they have quite a significant influence on the properties of your, your battery. And so there's really the three here. Uh, there's a carbohydrate polymers that people have been using. They're water-soluble, quite nice to work with, um, very cheap as well. Also, uh, conductive polymer binders, what you can do there is you just replace the conductive additive in your material, and so you're actually reducing the weight a little bit as well there. And then finally, uh, people also play with kind of the chemical and uh, mechanical properties of these binders by cross-linking them. Uh, what we do, and what I'll be talking about today, is a self-healing polymer coating, and it's a concept that uh, Chow, a postdoc in our group, published back in 2013. And how we think it works, uh, we're still doing some in operando studies up at Slack to really elucidate the mechanism. But what we understand right now is that in a traditional binder, you'll have large silicon particles that'll lithiate, and then after many cycles, they'll fracture, and your electrode will fail. But with our self-healing polymer, we design it to be highly stretchable and uh, a little bit flowable at room temperature as well. We think that as the silicon expands, cracks will form, but then as those cracks form, the self-healing polymer will allow those cracks to heal, and it will fill in any new surface area from the silicon, so you're really eliminating both of the mechanisms of failure in these silicon electrodes. One, again, is the electrolyte decomposition reaction on new surface, and the other is just mechanical failure of the electrode. Uh, we wanted to check this out just to be sure we were, uh, it was doing what we thought it was doing, and so here are some SEM images. This is after 20 cycles in the lithiated state, so in the expanded silicon state. You can take it out, and you see there's some really large cracks in the electrode that form, which is what we would expect in a material that has expanded so significantly during cycling. But then if we wait 10 hours, put it back in the SEM, and look at it again, we see that some of the smaller cracks have healed, and some of the larger cracks are smaller than they were before. And so we think that's really shows and illustrates that the self-healing mechanism is doing what we think it's doing. And now really the, the important uh, piece of data with the battery cycling is just the cycle life. So you can see this is uh, charge stored and then cycle on the bottom. So how many times we've charged and discharged it. And comparing it, you can see uh, alginate and CMC are two of the carbohydrate polymers that I was talking about before. And then PVDF is a binder that's used in graphite electrodes commercially. And we have really much, much better cycling life than any of these with large silicon particles. And all of those studies I talked about before, uh, the polymer binder studies, they all use small nano-sized silicon particles as well. Not nanostructured particles, but still uh, small particles that don't fracture because they're below that 150 nanometer critical dimension. And so what we're doing here instead is using about micron-sized particles. And these are about an order of magnitude of two cheaper than the nano-sized particles, which is why we're excited about them, and that we can get cycling stability that's comparable to uh, the nano-sized particles, but for, with a much cheaper material. And so moving from that background into, into my work, the question that I've been asking is, is why is this self-healing polymer so good? What exactly about this material makes it a good binder for these micron particles? And if, once we understand that, can we engineer specifically uh, new polymers that are even better? And so what I've done is taken, uh, if you're interested in the chemistry of the, the self-healing polymer, it's here. Uh, we start with a diacid and a triacid fatty acid material. So they're actually derived from vegetable oil. They're quite cheap as well. We functionalize them with amine and then functionalize them again with a urea to give us that hydrogen bonding that allows us to have the supramolecular self-healing capabilities that uh, we think help it do so well in the batteries. And all of the data I've showed before is with this 80-20 mixture, so mostly a linear supramolecular network. And what I have been able to do is play with the chemistry, and basically I can have any sort of con uh, concentration of trifunctional group between 20 and 70%. And what that allows us to do is really change the mechanical properties. And so uh, we can probe exactly how much is this viscous flow important, and what about the self-healing as well. Here, uh, we're looking at a frequency sweep on a rheometer. So you just take two parallel plates, and you oscillate them at a low strain and you change that frequency. So at slow times, at low frequencies, you're probing more of a liquid characteristic of the material, and then at fast times, you're probing it more like an elastic solid. 
uh, the two curves, the closed circles are the storage modulus, which is really the solid-like properties of the material, and then the open circles are the loss modulus, which is more of like the liquid part of the material. And where they cross over, that's what I've highlighted. That's where you can kind of say that the, the material is transitioning from a liquid-like characteristic to a solid-like characteristic. And what you can do from those times is you can calculate out a relaxation time, a characteristic time that the material behaves more like a liquid or more like a solid. And we use that to quantify um, these different binders that I've made and then compare them. The other thing we've done is a stress relaxation experiment. And what you do there is instead of oscillating the plate, you just step strain and then watch as the stress decays. And again, you can do some modeling to extract the relaxation times here. And what was exciting about that is that uh, two things. One, the data lined up, and so it was nice to know that um, these experiments agreed. And two, uh, we have materials that range over about two orders of magnitude of relaxation times. So the synthesis was successful, and we can actually probe uh, what we were trying to probe, which is these different mechanical times. Uh, so what we see, uh, this is exciting for two different reasons. Uh, the first one is that there's almost no change, and that doesn't really sound exciting, but from an industry perspective, if uh, you're working with a material that has a really wide processing window, so we can change the viscosity of this material, change how uh, you can process it, and that doesn't change the performance in the batteries at all. We see that for the first uh, about 16% through 57% trifunctional uh, groups in the, in the polymer, that they all cycle to about 175, 180 cycles before they reach 80% capacity, uh, which is better, you'll remember, than the data I showed before, and also, um, about the same. And then the second thing that I was happy to see is that there was at least one uh, binder that didn't perform as well, this 70% triacid material. And that only cycled to about 80 cycles, so even worse than um, the batteries before, before our, with all of our uh, device improvements and things like that. And so what that says, I think, is that really the viscous flow of this material, the, the self-healing capability of this polymer is critical to the way we've designed these electrodes, and it really allows them to function well with the micron-sized particles. And so with that, um, just kind of a conclusion and wrapping up a big picture, we've seen from our work and from literature that it really is important to have a strong interaction with the silicon surface through hydrogen bonding or some other interaction. Uh, we know now for our self-healing electrodes that we need a fast relaxation time for that healing to be effective, and then we also think we want really good adhesion and electrolyte interaction, which comes from data that I haven't been able to show today. And then zooming out even further, uh, I really do believe that if we can improve battery technology, we can help to reduce greenhouse gas production here in the US and around the world. Um, so I'd just like to thank uh, my advisor, Junan Bao, and Professor Yi Sui, who we collaborate with quite closely, and then two postdocs, Chow and Jung, who were really critical in this work and also um, just helping me in my PhD. Uh, GSEP for funding, NSF for funding, and the whole Bao group you can see there. Uh, and then if you're interested in hearing more, there's actually three posters um, from our group on this project that you can come uh, check out right after this. So thank you. So with this silicon anode technology, mm -hmm. what do you think is the ultimate uh, capacity increase you could get in a full cell? Um, so in a full electrode, if you didn't change the cathode, so I said 10% increase, and that's just for half of the battery. Um, so you've still got to think about things like current collectors and casings and electrolyte and separator and all of that. So if you just replaced graphite with silicon um, changed out today, you'd get about a two to three times increase or so um, with the best performance of silicon. And then if you switch to like a sulfur cathode or something, I think you can get up to like six, six times increase. The difference with cathodes, you have to put in more cathodes. Right, you do have to, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you end up going down actually in That's true, yes, yeah. It ends up, I, I guess depending on how you calculate it, it, it varies, but it, it is, you get percent increases up to, I think the maximum you can get is two or three times, but it maybe more practically ends up being 150% or something. Very nice. A couple Thank of you. quick questions. Sure. Um, 
In your last data chart, mm -hmm. you showed uh, what looks to be about a, close to a 50% reduction in capacity initially. Yeah. To what do you attribute that? Um, so this first, we actually cycle, I didn't mention, uh, these first three cycles are at C over 20 rate, um, which is one charge cycle per 20 hours and then discharge cycle per 20 hours, uh, so a 40 hour full cycle. And then we switch to C over 10. Uh, and that's a standard uh, cycling procedure that's been put out um, by a couple of the DOE programs on battery stuff. So that's some of, the, some of the capacity just comes from charging it more quickly, so kinetic effects. And then the other part, uh, that first cycle columbic efficiency for us is about 83% or so, and that's uh, probably some lithiation of the polymer a little bit, and then also that for forming of the initial uh, electrolyte decomposition layer that happens. And then any increased, or the few, the other drops, that uh, other part is probably just more electro electrolyte decomposition and then a little bit of silicon that's getting isolated probably. And that actually leads to the, the other question I had. What do you think would happen to the self-healing system if you went to a 2C or a 5C charge rate? Um, so this, it's actually terrible. I have the data. Um, once you go to, so 10C works, 5C, you see it at about uh, 1,200 or so, and then uh, when you go to 2C or 3C, it's, it's below 500. Um, so that's really a problem with this material. Uh, this wasn't specifically designed to be used in batteries. We had it in the lab and it was a good idea and it worked. Um, so what I'm doing now is working on the chemistry to see if we can increase that rate. Yep. So the, real, is this on? So, so the relaxation time seems to be an important property when looking at these different polymers. Yep. What sort of relationships can you draw between different structures and different properties with these polymers compared to the relaxation times? Um, you mean the like functionality of the material or branching or? Um, yes, effectively, when you change the polymer chemical structure, how does that affect the relaxation? Time? Sure, yeah, so when I increase the trifunctional groups present in the starting material, what I effectively do is increase the molecular weight of the material, the final supermolecular polymer. And so really, I think it's, it's that molecular weight effect that's affecting the relaxation time and probably a little bit of entanglements as well from that molecular weight increase. Thank you.